guys, I wanted to take just a minute and cover something pretty basic but pretty important, which is what is SIBO, what is CFO, and what is CMO? Like, what are all of these acronyms and what do they stand for? And what can we tell you about your body if you have one of these diagnoses? So here's the breakdown in a nutshell. Couple fold is that this is your body, more or less, your digestive tube. And that is a hollow tube from mouth to anus and it's all connected. Kind of weird to think about it that way. But you have the tube that starts with your mouth. The food travels down to your esophagus, to the stomach, which is just a dilated part of that digestive tube through the small bowel, the small intestine. This is the largest or the longest rather part and has the most surface area for absorption of nutrients. Finally, we get, we get down to the colon and then exit through the anus. So that's more or less the schematic of your entire digestive system. Sure, there's other organs that come in and they secrete juices, but this is pretty much how the tube is arranged. With these acronyms, they all have something in common. Generally, it's going to be small, intestinal, something, overgrowth. So for example, in the case of SIBO, that's small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. If it was the case, we'll kind of make it like multiple choice here. If it's small intestinal fungal overgrowth, CFO, then that is also going to be similar. And finally, CMO can stand for two things. A few of us in the functional medicine space, largely this movement has been led by Alex Vasquez. He's been saying for years and years now that it really should not even be called CBO. It should just be called CMO across the board. And that stands for small intestinal microbial overgrowth. And I think that actually is the best way to describe it. It is a dysbiosis and an overgrowth in the small intestine and trying to assign what the creepy crawler is that is the culprit can be a little bit dicey. It's easier to just say SEMO. Now, the other thing that's coming up more and more, and I saw, um, I forget who it was, but some SIBO expert emailed about this not long ago, that she was saying that now per more recent research, this could also stand for small intestinal methanogen overgrowth, or you could just drop the S and say intestinal methanogen overgrowth. And using that terminology, instead of saying methane dominant SIBO, since methanogens are not bacteria, we really should be using M to denote the microbial composition of that. I, yeah, I mean, either's fine. I think it's fine. Like if, if we wanna stick with the basics and still call it SIBO, it largely means a lot of the same stuff as far as I'm concerned. But yes, we've known for a long time actually that the archaea that produce methane are not actually bacteria. And if you call the bacteria, you're technically incorrect, but I don't really give a look. Anyway, let's move on to the depiction using my beautiful illustration of the human digestive tube, what all of this actually means. So on a normal day-to-day -day basis in a regular run-of-the-mill human being, you should have boatloads <laughs> of bacteria, a couple of yeast, a couple of parasites, a lot of viruses actually, a lot more viruses than we give credit for. You should have tons of creepy crawlers in your colon. There you go. There you go. Chock full of bacteria, yeast, whatever's in there. You should have a lot of microbes in your colon and that's fine. That's what the colon was largely built to do is just be like a frat house for all these bacteria. So it's cool. In a normal human situation, there are bacteria and yeast that live in the small bowel and the stomach and the esophagus and a heck of a lot that live in and around the mouth. But you can see they're far fewer than in the colon. The colon is very densely populated and has a lot more diversity in the ecosystem. The small bowel is generally much less populated and much less diverse. Same thing with the stomach, the esophagus, and the oral microbiome, I think we could give some credit for more abundance and more diversity, but it's not gonna touch the colon quite yet. The colon is really where it's at if you're a bacteria. With any of these, whether it be small intestinal bacterial, methanogen, microbial, 
or fungal overgrowth, all that diagnosis is telling you is that instead of having this nice situation where there's crap loads, pun intended, <laughs> crap loads of microorganisms in your colon and sparsely scattered microorganisms everywhere else, with SIBO, you start to get this kind of a situation where now some of the bacteria or yeast or microbes or methanogens, whatever it is, they have gotten the opportunity to creep up into the tail end or the distal part of your small intestine, or they can creep up higher and really fill up the small intestine if you have an aggressive case of SIBO. But this has gotten a chance to progress and now you have too many bacteria or archaea or yeast or whatever hanging out in your small bowel and that is SIBO in a nutshell or CFO, CMO, whatever you're calling it, whatever your diagnosis is and whatever your overgrowth is, this is what it's telling you. Now the thing to know, of course, is that there are usually protective mechanisms that keep your bacteria in your colon because your body is not dumb. Your body built itself knowing full well that you have two parts of the, of the single tube adjacent to each other, one of which has tons of bacteria and the other is supposed to have very little. So you have checks and balances in place like your migrating motor complex, like digestive juices and HCL, like your vagus nerve and your adrenals. There are things that keep this apparatus functioning and brush the bacteria towards the colon. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, go ahead and check out some of my videos on prokinetics, motility, MMC, and that'll at least get you started on that. But know that SIBO in and of itself, this is what it truly tells you as far as the diagnosis. But what it also is telling you is that there was a breakdown in one or more of these protective mechanisms that is allowing the bacteria or the yeast or the microbes or the methanogens to overgrow in a place where they don't belong. And that's really where you need to focus. 90% of your effort is treating the root cause and figuring out why you had a failure of those mechanisms and what you could do to heal your body.